Bible with you tonight. Open it up to 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, beginning in the first verse. 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, beginning in the first verse. I had thought when I found out that Brother Mike was not going to be with us tonight to bring the Word, I thought we would pick up and, and uh, talk some more along the lines that we did Sunday morning. After thinking about it and after uh, listening to it a time or two, I think Sunday morning might be the most, it's certainly one of the most important sermons that I have ever had the privilege of preaching. I know that it could have been done a lot better. And if you hear the sermon, you'll think, yeah, that could have been done a lot better. But I believe that it is one that is certainly that if we would take it to heart, if we get enough people to listen to it and take it to heart, it certainly would make a difference in their life and their walk with the Lord. The name of the sermon was The Authority of the Word of God. Amen. And God's Word is the last word. God's Word is the authoritative voice. Everything, Sister Minnie, that we, uh, we were talking about dreams and visions. Every dream that we have, every vision that we have, every revelation that we feel the Lord has given us must be compared to the Word of God. And if it does not, up, does not line up to God's Word, it is not of God. Simple. I'm not an expert in the field of dreams and visions, but I can tell you this much beyond the shadow of a doubt. If your dream tells you something other than what God's Word tells you, it is not from God. He has never contradicted His Word. He will not contradict His Word. He will confirm your dream by His Word, but He will never give you a revelation that you can say, well, you know, this is not in the Bible, but this is my revelation. Well, if your revelation can't be backed up with Scripture, it's not from God. So we talked along those lines, and this sort of goes with that, but not in the direction I thought it would. First, uh, 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, the first verse, <clears throat> if we've lived, ever lived in a day Whenever it's time not to give up, today is it. As I walked around these pews several days ago now, one day last week, and was praying and asking the Lord to move in the lives of those that come here and those that we hear from and those that are on our mailing list, and I got to thinking about how discouraged so many people are that you talk to. I've talked to people just in the last month. I can, I can narrow it down to that. I've talked to people. One person told me they just wasn't going to pray anymore. They were tired of praying and nothing happening. I've talked to preachers who have said, you know, I'm just, it's just not worth it. I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to give up. And the Holy Spirit was speaking to me as I round, made rounds around these pews and prayed, if there's ever a time not to give up, now is the time not to give up. If there's ever a time, Sister Minnie, to stand for the truth, today is the day to stand for the truth. If there's ever been a time to preach the truth, today's the day to preach the truth. Amen. If there's ever been a day to keep the local church open, today is the day. Say, Brother Billy, the church is not full. Yeah, that just confirms to me even more that we need a lighthouse in these last days and through our local churches and our local assemblies. And it seems like sometimes that it's hard. It's hard to go on. It's hard to press. But we're living in a pressing time. And those that endure to the end, the Bible says the same, shall be saved. Amen. He never promised us that it was going to be easy. As a matter of fact, His Word promises that it's going to get worse as we get closer to the end. So if we've li ever lived in a day when it's time to hold on, today is the day. 2 Corinthians 6 and 1, Paul writes these words, We then, as workers together with Him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. In other words, it is our prayer that after you have believed, after you have accepted the grace, after you have <clears throat> experienced the grace of God, that it not be done in vain. That you don't somewhere along the way throw up your hands and give up. That you somewhere along the way don't decide, you know, the journey is just not worth it. The fight is just not worth it. And Paul was telling them, it's my prayer, that the grace of God that has been shown in your life was not shown to you in vain, was not done in vain. And he says in the next verse, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 
And I know at times it seems like it's hard spiritually to put one foot in front of the other. I know sometimes as you struggle along and as you face battles in this life, the enemy will whisper to you, why don't you just give up? Why don't you just sit down? Where is that God? You know what like Nebuchadnezzar, I think, looked at the Hebrew children, unless I'm badly mistaken, he said, who is that God that shall deliver you out of the, furnace, out of the burning, fiery furnace? Amen? Sometimes the devil will whisper to you and he say, who is that God you're serving? Why do you keep giving for? Things just keep getting worse. Why do you keep going to church for? Things ain't getting any better. Why do you keep praying for? It seems like you're not getting any answers, are you? Have you seen the answer to the prayer, the answer that you want anyway to the prayers that you've been praying? And he'll try to get you to give up. He'll try to get you to sit down. He'll try to get you to throw up your hands and just say, forget it, it's not worth it. Oh, but yes it is. If we just hold on, amen, there is no way, even a fool can see today that we are living in the last days. There's no way that you can look at the condition of this world and not realize something's got to happen. Something has got to change, amen. We're living in the last days. <clears throat> if there's ever been a time to fight the good fight, Today is it. If there's ever been a time to keep the doors of your church open, Sister Mindy, today is the day. Regardless of whether the crowd comes, regardless of whether it seems like you, you're barely meeting the bills, you've barely been able to make it, today is not the day to, to quit and sit down. Today is the day to go on. Today is the day to keep your light shining. Today is the day to keep your voice being heard, the voice of truth in a world of deception. Oh, we've never needed more lighthouses than we need today. It's so dark, so perilous. The Bible says in the last days, perilous times shall come, and they are upon us. They are upon us. So the Lord's speaking to us tonight, trying to encourage us to go on. See, we don't have long. They used to sing a song, This world can't stand long. And that's the truth. Better get ready. Don't wait too late. Amen. Jesus is coming. I know you've heard it. I've heard it since I was just knee high to a grasshopper underneath the church pew, and sitting in the church pew and in Sunday school class. I've heard Jesus is coming. The only thing that assures me tonight is that it's closer now than it's ever been before in my life. And I realize that as I stand here, I can't give you the date. I can't give you the time. But I can tell you, without fear of contradiction, He's coming. And if he tarries, I believe he's going to come in my lifetime. But if he don't, what is life but a vapor? You know, we can think, well, he may come. He may. Well, maybe. He might not come. I mean, he's coming. I, don't, I didn't mean that maybe he's not. He is coming. We just don't know when. We may go by way of the grave before he comes by way of the clouds. But when you think about it, no matter who you ask, whether they're 80 years old, whether they're 30 years old, you ask them, how does it seem to you like that it's been 30 years, 40 years? Most people will say, no, time passes by so fast. Brother Hinton used to say he believed the Lord would come back in his lifetime and he's been gone for 10 plus years now. But it doesn't seem like it's been that long. Time stands still for nobody. And whether you go by way of the grave or whether you go by way of the clouds, you are going to go <clears throat> one of these days. One of these days, and you can be, you, if you're sitting out there today and you say, I don't believe in the rapture, well, okay. Do you believe in death? Have you stood by the graveside of enough loved ones to know that you one day will rest in that coffin? <coughs> will you be ready? That's the question. Did you hold on? Did you finish your course? Did you fight the good fight of faith? Did you hold on? Because. In the day and hour that we live in, the enemy's doing everything he can to try and keep you from going on. To try and keep you from making it. Why is he so mad? The devil's spiteful. He's greedy. He don't want you to make it because he ain't going to make it. He can't have it, so he don't want you to have it. You ever heard kids say, well, if I can't have it, you, well, maybe you've heard some adults say it. If I can't have it, you ain't going to have it, or they're not going to have it. Yeah. Well, that's the way the devil is. If he can't have the prize, he don't want you to have the prize. If he can't make heaven his home, guess what? He don't want you to make heaven your home. He's not looking forward to torturing you in hell because he's going to be in torture in hell himself. Hell is not going to be a party for the devil. Read your Bible. 
The Bible says that he'll be cast into the lake of fire, just like all of those that didn't, that, that their names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life. He's not going to trot around down there and be your taskmaster. He knows what his future is. And he wants the same thing for you. If I can't make it, you ain't going to make it, or I'm going to try to keep you from making it anyway. So I want to give you some scriptures tonight about holding fast. Holding fast. The Bible says in, in Galatians 6 and 7, it says, Be not deceived, and this is a scripture that we quote quite often around here, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth in his, to the flesh, to his flesh, excuse me, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now what's that mean, Brother Billy? I'm glad you asked me. That means if you don't give up, if you don't sit down, if you don't get so aggravated and disgusted that you just throw up your hands and turn away from God. That means, Brother Rodney, that if you hold on to the going on comes on. That means if you hang on to the horns of the altar. That means if you grab a hold of Jesus and regardless of the storm, you don't let go. If you faint not in due season, you will reap what you have sown. The spiritual things that you have laid up the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The, the, the heavenly treasure that you have laid up. It would be sad today if you could look out through your mind's eye and see a farmer as during the spring he teals up the ground and you see the sweat as it drops off of his brow and see the seed as he plants it and see all of the preparation that he did and then you see him throughout the summer taking care of his crops and keeping the weeds out and just about time for the harvest he just quits. I'm tired. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of growing. I'm just tired of taking care of this garden. When in just a matter of time, just a matter of days, the harvest, it would have been time for harvest. It, but he fainted before, it was, before he was able to reap that which he sowed. Same way with you spiritually. You live for the Lord for 50 years, but if, the end, if at the end you give up, you sit down, you throw up your hands, you forsake Him, then all you've done has been in vain. It says you will reap in due season if you faint not. And the Bible talks about holding fast to some things. 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, the first thing we want to look at, the Bible teaches us to hold fast to that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16 says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit, Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You see, the Bible says to grab a hold of. See that, that term, hold fast? That means to get a hold of it and not let go. And he says to hold fast to the good. You see, there's still good and evil. There's still right and wrong. I know that the lines have become so blurred that most of the world don't know what's good and what ain't good. But they're still good. And the Bible instructs us to grab a hold of the good, the things of God, and don't let them go. The things that are eternal, only the things of God are eternal. Everything in this world will pass away. Your money, your home, your fancy clothes, your bank account, none of that amounts to a hill of beans when compared to the spiritual things in life. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. Shun evil. Get a hold of the good things. The second thing that the Bible tells us to hold fast, and there may be more than these, but this is what we've got for tonight. 2 Timothy, and I love reading the books of Timothy where Paul is instructing, and not just instructing Timothy, but instructing us as well because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for you. Amen? Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy, the first chapter, the 12th and 13th verses, Paul admonishes Timothy and he's teaching him something. Here he says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For now I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And then he says these words, Hold fast, the form of sound words 
which thou hast heard of me in faith and in love which is in Christ Jesus. What's he talking about? Hold on to sound words, meaning true words. He's talking about holding on to the Word of God. Amen? And in the day that we live in, you better hold on to the Word of God. You better use the Word of God as your measuring stick against all other things. You better use it as your scales to weigh everything that you hear, every doctrine that you hear taught, every sermon that you hear preached. Make sure it lines up with the book. Paul said, Timothy, get a hold of the Word and don't let it go. The only way to dethrone deception today is to know the truth. The only way for you not to be deceived, you might sit out there tonight and you might say, well, I'm not ever going to be deceived. You will be if you don't know the truth. The only way not to be deceived. I've heard some things that make, make your hair stand up on the back of your neck. is so stupid. But because I knew the Word, I thought, that ain't God. That ain't from God. A lot of people don't know the Word. All they know, Brother Tommy, is what they hear the preacher say on Sunday morning or Wednesday night because they never spend any time, Sister Minnie, reading the Word for themselves. I don't mean that in a harsh way, but it's the truth. Many people have no idea what's inside their Bible. They take it to church with them. Some people leave it at church to save their seat. They take it to church. They pack it back out. They go to the Scriptures, some of them, that the pastor is preaching from, but that's it. That's all of the Word that they ever get. We better know the Word for ourselves. And Paul's admonishing Timothy and us too. You better get a hold of the Word and hold on to it. Yeah. Hold fast to it. Yeah. Make sure that everything... What got me so stirred up with Sunday morning's sermon and took us in that direction is I heard... I, I tuned into a, a, a man who used to support this ministry and was listening to a radio program he was doing. And he was talking about his dreams and his visions that he'd been having. <clears throat> And 99% of what he was stating as fact simply because he had a dream and a vision wasn't, was not backed up by the Word of God. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said these words, if he'd only just look in the book. If he'd only just compare his dreams to what my Word says. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not an expert and please don't people don't start coming to me wanting me to interpret your dreams. I, I, might, I could if the Holy Spirit allowed me to do that. But I'm not Joseph. Amen? Yeah. But I can tell you this much. If you'll take it to the Word, if you say, this is a dream I had. Is it from God? Let me see whether it's from God or not. <clears throat> I know we've all had dreams that have troubled us and we wondered, is this from God? Is he sh and He does show people things in dreams. He shows people things in visions. That's His Word. He uses dreams and visions. And He'll do so in the last days. That's what it says in the book of Acts. But if your dream goes against God's Word, it ain't from God. It's either from the devil or you ate a burrito before you went to bed. You ate too late that night or something. Yeah. Something caused you to have a dream, but it wasn't from God. Yeah. If you vision, people will, will, will base their entire doctrine on something that they saw on a vision yeah. and never compare it to God's Word. Paul's saying, Timothy, hold on to the Word. Hold on to the Word. And the day that we live in is getting more rare and rare, the Word of God. We're seeing a famine in the land. Yeah. Not a famine of bread, not a famine of water, but a famine of hearing the Word of God. Yeah. The third thing that we want to look at, in the book of Hebrews, the third chapter, and the fourth verse, Hebrews the third chapter, and the fourth verse, the Bible says, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Verse 6 says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the speaking of the hope firm unto the end. If we'll hold fast our hope, our confidence in Christ, our faith in Him to the end. The Bible says that he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Paul is saying here in the book of Hebrews, if you'll hold fast to your faith. Because see, the winds are blowing. The winds of doubt, the winds of doctrine. 
trying to shake your faith loose. You better have a bulldog grip on your faith in Jesus tonight. Listen, I'll let you down. Sister Minnie will let you down. Your mama will let you down. Your pastor will let you down. Maybe not intentionally, but sooner or later, we're going to let you down. But God won't. So you, you trust Him. You count on His Word. If He said it, that settles it. Amen? Period. His Word is the final authority. Hold fast the confidence and the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. The fourth and the last thing is to hold fast the profession of our faith. Hebrews 10 and 23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful. <laughs> I love that. For He is faithful that promised. He is faithful. Paul said, and I believe i got this scripture up here, For I am persuaded that He is able to keep that, I think we read it, which I, which I have committed unto Him against that, not that I'm able, not that man is able, not that the church is able, but that Jesus is able. Hold fast the profession of your faith. Let the redeemed, if there's ever been an hour when the redeemed of the Lord need to say so, we need to say so. Amen? If there's ever been an hour when we need to make, leave, when we need to make sure that our faith is known, it's today. We don't need people scratching their head wondering, well, Wonder if they go to church or not. Wonder if they are saved or not. Wonder if they're born again or not. If I had to scratch my head and wonder that about you, that leads me to think you ain't. Amen? Because somewhere, some way, your fruit ought to be showing to somebody that you know Jesus. Amen? That you're not the same as you used to be. Hold fast to the profession of your faith. Jesus would tell the churches, a couple of the churches in the book of Revelation, Thyatira, he would tell them, but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. That which has been the truth that you have, the relationship that you have, hold fast. Get a hold of it. Hold on to it because the enemy is trying to rip it from you. The world is trying to rip it from you. The flesh is trying to rip it from you. Hold on to it with all you got. Don't let go of Jesus. Don't let go of your faith. Don't let go of the Word of God. I know sometimes you think, well, I just don't know if I can go on. Well, just hang on. Just hang on till the going on comes on. Just grab a hold of the altar and say, Lord, I don't understand it. My goodness, I can't tell you the times I've prayed that prayer. I've said, Lord, I don't understand it. I don't know why this has happened. I don't know why I'm going through this, but this one thing I know, I trust Your Word. Hallelujah. I trust Your Word. And Your Word says that this thing didn't come to destroy me, but will work together for my good. I trust Your Word. I trust your word. You can trust his word. Hold fast. Jesus told this church, hold fast till I come. Endure to the end. Faint not and you will reap in due season. He told the church of Philadelphia, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Hold on to it. Hold on to your faith. You can make it. I realize sometimes you think, well, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. You can make it. Just hold on to Jesus. Keep your eyes on the prize. Don't give up. Oh, my, my, I've seen people. I've seen anointed preachers. Preachers that could preach better than me. Preachers that knew more of the Word than me. They done sat down somewhere and gave up. Oh, what a shame that is. I've seen people that had relationships with the Lord. I mean prayer warriors. Sister, many of them done gave up for some reason or another and just sat down somewhere. Oh, I'm sure if you talk to them tonight, they could give you some reason or some, something that they think may justify it or they may just say, I don't know what happened. But either way, they've sat down before they, finished, they made it to the finish line. They've sat down before they've made it to the end of the race. You see, we don't, we don't run this race in vanity. We don't run this race for nothing. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Your race tonight, your fight tonight is not in vain. It was the Apostle Paul that said, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. See, there is a reason to run this race. He said, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. There is a spiritual warfare. There is a prize to be won. We don't fight this thing in vain. We're not living for Jesus in vain. 
My Lord and my God. I wish the church could get a hold of it. We're not doing this just to go through the motions. We're not doing this just so we can be part of some religious group. Oh, there's a prize, my, my, at the end of the finish line. We're not running for nothing. And we've come too far to look back or to sit down and give up. The prize is right before us. We just got to keep pressing. We just got to keep going. We got to hold fast to the Word. Hold fast to our faith. My, my, my. Listen to what Paul said. And I'm closing. Paul said, brethren, I count, and I'm in Philippians, the third chapter. Philippians 3 and 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Listen to that for just a minute before we read on any farther. The Apostle Paul had been through a lot of things. Matter of fact, in one part it tells he'd been shipwrecked and he'd been, you know, and he'd been in the deep and he'd been beaten and he'd had stripes on his back and his testimony goes on and on. He'd been cold, he'd been hungry, he'd He'd suffered a lot of things. He said, Brother, I, brethren, I, I, and if he was here today, he'd probably agree with me. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He probably, didn't, he probably didn't understand everything that happened to him. That's probably what he'd agree with. I don't know of anybody that understands everything other than Jesus. Amen. Everything wasn't just like what I wanted. You think Paul wanted to be through in jail? You think he wanted to be shipwrecked on the island with those cannibals? You think that he wanted to be bitten by the snake that he shook off in the fire? You think that he wanted to go to Nero's shop block and have his head? And I'm talking about just his personal. I realize he said to live is for Christ to die is gain. That was his spiritual man. But I'm talking about his fleshly part that's weak like we are. There was something in him, you know, that just didn't like the idea of getting his head chopped off. Amen? Everything didn't go just like he wanted to. He hadn't, he hadn't, he counted not himself to have apprehended. It wasn't over yet. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And he says in verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul understood that this was a pressing way. There used to be an old song that they sung I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. God didn't promise you one either. I realize if you stayed home from church Sunday morning and rested on the couch and watched the TV preachers, most of them probably told you that God wants your best for the best for you and that He don't want you to ever struggle and He don't want you to ever have to need for anything and that everything's supposed to come up roses for you, but that's not what God's Word says. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. The Bible doesn't teach us that everything's going to go our way and that everything's going to be just hunky-dory in the way that we want it. As a matter of fact, there are going to be trials. What did he tell? The, the, what did Peter, I believe it was Peter that wrote, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials. Amen. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that have been sent not to destroy you, but to sent to make you stronger. They're sent to make us stronger in the Lord. How strong would your muscles be if it never got any exercise? How strong would your faith be if it never got any exercise? If you never had to use it, if you never had to put it into action, how strong would your faith be? Not very strong. So Paul's charge to Timothy we find in 2 Timothy 4 and 1. Paul says, I charge thee before... Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead and is appearing in His kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That sound familiar to anybody? But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now we could feel that right there into dreams, visions. Because i got news for you. If your dream goes against God's Word and doesn't line up with it, it is a fable. If your vision doesn't line up with the truth, it is a fable. And the Bible says they'll turn from the truth and they'll go after fables. But he says, but watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. 
Oh, I like this. And Paul said, For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. What are we talking about tonight? We're closing. We're talking about holding fast to the things that God has given us. We're talking about holding fast to the truth. Holding fast to the faith. Holding fast to our relationship with God. Holding fast to eternal things and not temporal things. Paul said, I fought a good fight. The devil would like nothing better than for you to give up the fight tonight. He said, I have finished my course. The devil would like nothing better for you to fall short of finishing your course. How much joy do you think it would bring to him? You've lived for the Lord all these years. You've went on and you've prayed and you've seen miracles and you've, you've done all this. And How much joy do you think it would give him to see you just sit down and give up? Ain't no sense in going on. He'd have a party. Because that's what he wants. He don't want you to make it. Matter of fact, he'd stick his tongue out to you even more. Look here. You wasted your whole life. You could have been having fun out in the world. The world don't know what fun is. Amen. But he wants you to quit. He wants you to sit down. He don't want you to fight. And it is a fight. Amen. There is a fight going on. Not with you. I'm not talking about your brother and sister, your mother in law. I'm talking about the spiritual warfare that goes on. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. The devil would like nothing better than for you to let go of your faith tonight. But the Bible is telling us to hold fast. God's Word is telling us to get a hold of your faith and don't let go. The devil wants you to give up. Paul finishes off this here in 2 Timothy 4 and 8. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But he doesn't stop there. It says, And not to me only, but unto all them that love His appearing. So not just for Paul, but to all them that love His appearing. Somebody's phone messing with my fingers here. <clears throat> He said, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And he doesn't stop there. He includes you. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. To all them. That's you. By the grace of God, you can make it. Don't give up. Hold on. Hold on. I've said it before and i say it again. If I have to, I'll crawl across the finish line. I may be battered, may be bruised, but I'm going to cross the finish line because I've come too far and so have you. You've come too far to go back now. You might say, preacher, I'm not good enough. Well, welcome to the crowd. There ain't no one of us in here tonight that are good enough. Only by His grace, only by His mercy, only by His blood are we made good enough. And if you think you are good enough, you need to find an altar somewhere and repent because you ain't good enough. None of us are. Hold fast to that which is good. Hold fast to the form of sound words. Hold fast to His Word, in other words. Hold fast the confidence that you have in Him, your faith that you have in Him, your profession of your faith. Hold fast till He comes because He is coming. Whether He blows the trumpet and calls you through the air or whether He takes you by way of the grave, He's coming to get you. Your number, sooner or later, will be up. Hold fast to what you have and don't let any man take it. It's too late in the game to give up now. Too late in the race to stop now. <coughs> Hold on to Jesus and He will take you home. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Somebody else have something tonight.